Good evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, this week's technical seminar. I uh, can't remember what the title of this one is. Uh, one Data versus information, what's the difference? God, me, what's that mean? Well, Ashley Hemming's from InterServe uh, hopefully will explain that. I've been working with Ashley on our new headquarters over in Solihull, and uh, as a, an MEP engineer, the lingo and the speak that uh, Ashley comes up with is totally foreign to me. So, yeah. actually, I thought it would be a really good idea to actually get Ashley to come along and explain that and share that with you guys. It may actually mean you look at, look at things slightly differently in the future. Um, George Stevenson from Active Plan is also going to assist um, Ashley as well. So, without further ado. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Um, so this is the, uh, the agenda, if you like, the content. Um, we're going to be talking about being to Catham, that's a mystical beast that's out there. Um, uh, and then we're going to hand over to George, who's the real star of the show, uh, <laughs> to talk about lexicon and the stuff he's doing with the BRE. Um, and then we're going to have a bit of a quiz as well. It's a little bit different tonight. Um, but it, this is what I'd like to talk to you about. Um, facilities management. Perhaps something that you know is, is one of those black arts to those of you who are in the consultancy side. Um, and, and this is what we do. There are engineers out there, uh, highly qualified engineers who are dealing with the engineering stuff. Uh, it's all this this stuff that comes after handover. Um, and, and this is generally when you start talking about BIM. Uh, you start looking at these acronyms, don't you? The employer's information requirements, and then the asset information requirements, and then BIM itself, uh, and then leading all the way through to the CAFAM system, the Computer Aided Facilities Management System. But as far as I'm concerned, I think there's something missing. I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, at the end of uh, this presentation. This is what we generally are using at the moment, which is COBE. You probably recognise anybody who's involved in BIM that COBE is that data exchange vehicle that is being used by the construction industry to hand over to FM. Uh, so, as far as we're concerned, in terms of the data, what we want to see is the, the who, the why, the what, the where, how, and there's another one, a little word that's missing. We'll talk about that in a minute as well. Uh, also, you know, there's this pariah of handing information over and sort of getting the O&Ms, isn't it, uh, and getting to this ward and just chucking it over to FM and then the job's done. Now is that the way that we should be doing things? Um, this is what we hope happens and this is what FM uh, facilities managers out there believe happens. Somewhere in the middle is this bit of magic that happens. The BIM guys <laughs> will sort it out for us and they're going to give us um, this concise, actionable insights. Uh, from all this noisy, complex data and stuff that they don't understand. So, and that's going to happen three months before. Okay. Does that happen? Yeah. Indeed. So, actually, for us, it's really simple. Um, what we want to see is this spreadsheet that we use that goes into our CAFM system, that gets uh, uploaded to the CAFM system. We use three IBM, Maximo, Concept, and Planet. You might have heard of them. And each of these have a standard spreadsheet. As you can see, it's got the location, it's got the description of the asset, it's got the asset type. Probably 20, 30 columns, really, really simple stuff. The same process that we use for going out and doing an asset survey, if we receive a building that's already built, it's been there for 30, 40 years. So no different, really, in terms of BIM. That's the output we want to see from Kobe. This is what's perceived to happen. And you may have had this experience yourself, that Kobe to facilities managers looks like this like a bunch of spreadsheets with gaps in it. You can see the black holes in there, can't you? And they say, well, the, 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 the data's rubbish. Why is it rubbish? And then the builders say, the construction say, well, you should have told us you wanted this two years ago. So there's this misnomer that actually Kobe is going to sort everything out for us. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute as to the problems why that happens. <coughs> so this is it. The asset information model actually, as far as we're concerned, is Kobe. And, and that's what we're using to upload to this template that we take into our CAFM system. And therefore, that's our priority. Because 
on day one of receiving a building, we want to start issuing work orders to our engineers. And we want to be able to use the data from the AIM, from the asset information model, to be able to do that. The problem is, you know, is that there's an issue. On most of the BIM projects that we have carried out over the last few years, we still end up doing a survey. So that, well, let me explain what that means. You get an iPad and you send two or three guys into that building that's just been built and they go and survey it like they would any other building like this, for instance. And they go and say, right, well, that's a grid <coughs> there, that's a pipe fitting, that's a blind. And they collect that data. That's, how can that be? It's bonkers, isn't it? So this, as far as I'm concerned, is what happens. When I've sat in design meetings, I can sit at the same table as a design manager and they're thinking one thing and I'm thinking another. And we might be thinking, well, we understand each other, but actually we don't. It's two different things. When you Google Kobe, this is what you get in that, that fantastic bit of um, template, that text that you get. And it talks about delivering asset data and asset information, and we're able to make decisions based on that data. So I'd like to introduce you now to George Stevenson, who is the MD for Attica. Um, he's been working with us a lot on how we can create this asset information model that makes sense to all parties that are involved in this process. Um, and that missing word is which. Which information do we need? Because actually, data equals information equals data. Over to George. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to sit down in a moment because I want to do a bit of live stuff. But um, yeah, we've we've been involved in the in the BIM world for about 30 years, uh, database-driven CAD, um, uh, building modelling, and we've also been working in the uh, maintenance management area as well from a software perspective. So we we're a bit unusual in that we we actually have got a a real strong understanding of what information is needed to run and operate buildings, as well as understanding about 3D modelling and objects and database-driven CAD and, and the like. So what we've done is brought those areas together to focus on something called an asset information model. And the asset information model is both the thing that you use at the end, but it's also the thing that you use at the beginning to define what you need at the end. So if we look at a couple of projects that we've been involved in recently, we've just, we're just completing at the moment Coventry University for BAM um, and we've, uh, we've created a, a coordinated asset information model over the last couple of years for them uh, from the supply chain's information. Um, we've then used that to populate uh, Planon uh, which is the CAFOM, CAFOM system that uh, the university is using. Um, a different one, we're working with the BRE and uh, the BRE have decided to digitise their estate. There's two elements to the BRE's estate. At Watford they've got a big site uh, with lots of buildings on it so they wanted to have that as digital information um, and secondly they've got an enormous portfolio of, uh, of publications that they wanted to move from analog into digital. Uh, so they chose us as their partner to do both of those things. And I'm going to show you an example of what we've been doing with the, the BRE <coughs> Building 16, which is a, a 20 year old building, uh, but what they wanted to do was turn it into a BIM model, an asset information model, that they could use to test out a lot of the new technologies that they've got in terms of IoT and sustainability. We were recently brought in on a project that had been uh, 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 for Turner Construction in America. Um, they've been working on this project for about three or four years. They tried two different software applications that in theory were supposed to be delivering the, the um, handover information. But both of them had basically failed to deliver and we were sort of parachuted in at the end um, and uh, it took us about uh, two weeks to actually transform that. This is an acute hospital in the centre of uh, Manhattan 
Uh, so it's going to be quite a nice prestigious project for us. But we've got a Navisworks model and all of the Kobe uh, data actually now integrated with that. And it's going to be used to export to uh, a CAFM application called M4, uh, which is a big one in America apparently, I've not heard of it. Um, and we've just started working uh, with um, Ashley and, and Martin uh, on um, Ingenuity House. And the objective of that one is to basically create both an asset information model, but also populate the CAFM system. So um, I'll go into that in a bit more detail in a moment. So where we are, <coughs> the, the, the approach that we take, we hold uh, an asset information model in the cloud and we then have interfaces with all the different applications whereby we can uh, bring in schedules of accommodation uh, information about uh, maintenance procedures all into a common database but we build those links so they're two-way so that the information can be fed into the database and then back out again. What's different about our database is it's a spatial database which means that it understands XYZ coordinates so it means that we extract information from AutoCAD, from Revit uh, from uh, Archicad and we actually hold that in the same database that all of the non-geometric information is held as well. And why is that important? Well one of the big problems that we have on all projects is room numbers and spaces. Yeah? Uh, so rather than all of that information just being held in isolation in a CAD system or in a building model, what we do is we take the space we hold the space in the database and all the references so it means that the information is always coordinated. If the architect, if the architect room numbering is then changed by the client or is changed by the project team, it doesn't matter because we hold all three or four different room numbers against that. So we're working at the moment on um, uh, QE Hospital for NG and that project's been open, what, eight years and the room numbering has changed. So we've got room data sheets and room data for 4,000 rooms which refers to room numbers which are no longer there in the drawings because that's moved on. So it's a matter of coordinating that. So the key thing about that is databases are the best place to manage that type of information. You'll also see that we've got the various different CAFM systems at the end there as well so we can populate anything. So I'll come back to that in a moment. So on the, on the Coventry building, these are plan-on, what are called ditch sheets. The, these are the uh, import sheets for plan-on. So we, build, we can populate those. We're doing the same with Planet, the same with Maximo, and on Ingenuity House, they're using Concept. So that's what we're currently in the process of, of doing. So, um, one of the things that I find interesting is that um, asset information means different things to different people. The view is, certainly in the BIM world, is that we just hand over a set of information. Which FM system are you using? Yeah? And they get frustrated when the FM organisation or the, the operational side can't ask, answer that question. Well, one of the reasons they can't answer it is that you've got a number of different stakeholder groups. You've got people that are using the building. So FM to them probably means room bookings, booking desks, car parking, space utilisation, and maybe a help desk. Yeah. The engineering teams, yes, the PPM system, critical part of what they do. That's typically what people are using Concept Plan on, uh, Planet um, uh, and Maximo for. But actually, the BMS system is normally a discrete application. That's a software application. And you've got other software applications, typically, for doing water treatment, maybe cleaning, fire, 
These are often different software applications that are managing that data set. And certainly the O&M information is a, an important element of that, and most of that information doesn't go into the CAFM system. So therefore you need to have an environment that's managing the asset data. And then when we come on to the finance team, they're probably using Oracle or SAP, and they've got a different set of requirements as well. So what that broadly means is that we need to be able to have an environment where data and information is at the core, rather than uh, which software application can we just simply populate. So the way in which the world is going now is everything needs to be in a digital environment where data is connecting to data. But to do that, you've got to have correctly structured data. So what I'm going to come on to in a moment is the initiative that we've been developing with the BRE and other bodies around data templates, standardising the way data is held and then standardising the way it's then can be used. So most people would look at that and say, well, that's a BIM model. Yeah. Actually, it's a 3D model. Um, and there you've got an object in there and we've got some intelligence behind it. You know, in the Revit family, we've got information about that. But you'll notice that a lot of the information isn't populated. That's very typical in many BIM implementations. You've then got drawings and you've got other documentation. Now, that you might say that's a rich BIM model with lots of data. Actually, it's, it's a 3D model that's got lots of attached information because this data here isn't computer readable. It can't be queried by another application. And why is that important? Well, really, if you're going to really deliver value at the operational side of things, it's not just a matter of a one-way transfer of data. It's not just a matter of passing over a file which then can be read by the other party. What we actually need to do is rather than have these one-way files that are designed to maybe go from Revit to Maximo or Planet as a one-off transfer, the the exercise of keeping all of those interfaces up to date is a nightmare. Yeah. Um, so therefore, because software c companies can't, you know, they they just don't want that type of uh, work. So what we've got here is Kobe, and what Kobe is is a neutral standard that plugs in the middle there, and it also means that we've then we're then able to develop what are called application programmers interfaces so the different applications can then interoperate with that data and use it within their own world so it means that information about a product can be held within a design system so as part of this exercise what we've been doing is building a series of components which then go to make that happen we've got a template management system which I'll come on to in a moment that can be used to create standard product type libraries and that's what InterServer now using to standardize the way in which they're managing their, their um, uh, maintenance information. We've then got a tool for creating asset information requirements. So if you're a client you can say this is the data set that we actually want to see out at the end about a heating system, a boiler, a chiller, a space, uh, a facility and by defining what data you need at the end, at the, at the end, if you start that at the beginning, you can automatically test to make sure that you're receiving it. And we can then validate that information and ensure that you get your asset information model at the end. Mm -hmm. So the way in which we do that <coughs> is that we've got uh, a series of different templates which the Construction Products Association has as a uh, they're using that in an initiative called Lexicon, which will give product manufacturers the means to create all their content uh, free of charge. And the product library can then be used within the software applications. So what that means is that within Revit, for example, 
This is what's called a data service. It looks as though it's within the software itself, but actually it's a connection within the application. Why is that important? Well, it means that it can be kept up to date by the manufacturers. It can be kept up to date as things change. So it means that this data, although it appears to be in that Revit object, it's actually coming in from the cloud. So it means that somebody can use the design application and automatically be verifying that information. In the same way, you can say the same with the uh, information that we need uh, as far as the client asset information requirements concerned. And why is that important? Well, here we've got a really rich BIM model, which NG Baby uh, provided to us. And they've got a lot of data in here. There's a, a lot of information most of it is design information um, and that's attached as what, what are called um, shared parameters to that particular object um, but it's what's called metadata so it's not really managed in a structured way and the difficulty with that is that if you've then got a number of different people all calling an item a description something different then it, it becomes very confusing. So what we've been doing with the BRE is creating this application that will then um, glue all of that together. So if I'm, I'm just going to show you one of the live models. So here this is, uh, oh, that's interesting. Why has that stopped? I don't think so, no, it's not. That's a bit weird. Let me see if I can go back. Oh, that's really irritating. Uh, try, try yeah, I can jump back in, yeah. Well, I don't, I don't understand why it's uh, just stopped. Can I just try again, just plugging it back in? Ah. Let's just see if I can fire it up. It's weird. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I, I was going to show you that live, but I'll... I'll skip on to it. Um, okay, so we create an asset information model, and one of the reasons where we've we've built this templating tool is that different people use uh, or call things differently. So here we've got a data sheet for a boiler. Um, with lots of great information. Here we've got a data sheet for a different manufacturer's boiler with very, very similar information. The problem is that they call things something slightly different. Uh, so um, what, what we're finding, this is really weird. Okay, we, we've, we've launched this, um, this data book application this week and it's using something called a templator. So what the templator does, it allows you to say, what information do we uh, want to define that describes a, uh, a template? So here we've got information about a pump, its description, its manufacturer, the model number, the weight, uh, the height. Now what is important with all pumps is that they all should be described in the same way. Yeah. Uh, but different manufacturers, which is the point I was trying to make with the data sheets there that didn't work, uh, with the people call things something slightly different. And that is impossible for a computer to read. So we need to have that in a digital format. Um, and that's what we're doing with Kobe data. So we've got um, uh, information about that. And anything that is electrically powered then has got the same uh, set of information. So this templating tool, which you can all have access to, it's free, 
uh, allows us to say, right, how are we actually going to define these items? A pump, for example, uh, or a uh, it's tied into something called the Building Smart Data Dictionary. So this is BIM uh, speak. And what this is doing, it's enabling us to say, this is, these are the property sets and the attributes that are needed to describe the, this particular uh, type of product. And then that becomes standardized through the industry, uh, which is going to make things a lot easier. It's also built in so it, it ties in with Uniclass and the National BIM Library, etc. So the idea is to glue it all together. Uh, SIBSI, are the uh, relevant authority that's going to be validating and checking to make sure that the right attributes are described for each of these elements. So they then become standardised through the process. This is the... So, um, and that, that it's, it, it can then create templates which then are used to capture information and then used by product manufacturers to standardise the way in which their products are, are described. So the overall effect of that is that what we're doing is bringing together CAPEX and OPEX by having a series of tools that, that glue these things together. Um, so the same for a space. What we're able to do is to then say what information do we want to know about a space. We want to know, for example, its, its height, finished ceiling height, its uh, floor coverings and then those are then built into standard libraries. So what this means is that we can then have uh, a, uh, uh, an end user's view of, uh, of a building. So the room data, what activities is that space designed to support? Um, what equipment's in there? Uh, and therefore we've got a template for a standard space type. We've then got information that can then be added so it means that you don't have to put all the information into the 3D model. So for example, somebody that's looking at, uh, we, we want information about floor coverings. So you see the ticks there tell us what data we want and what data we don't want. And here we've said that we want a finished ceiling height. When we receive the data through, it automatically checks and it highlights the fact that we've not got that finished ceiling height. But the person that's probably giving us that is an installation contractor. So they're putting the ceilings in. They don't want to create a 3D model to do that. They just want to say that we're putting that in at 3.8 meters. So they can enter that straight into the asset information model and then, or provide a schedule, a spreadsheet, and then it updates it. So it's now telling us that we've got the right data. Um, so exactly the same with FM. So you might have a, a broken door. What you want to be able to do is to be able to find out information about the ironmongery and know what the uh, maybe the warranties are on the ironmongery. And the same with uh, the engineering system. We want to know which rooms that heating system is actually supporting. So the PPM can then reflect what spaces are going to be impacted by, by the, the work. So overall what we've got is a, a model um, which is both 2D and 3D. It's interactive and you can also have the information presented in different forms. So for example, information about the lighting layouts we can have as a 3D model that you can walk around or you can have it as a plan view. Most engineers will probably want it as a plan view because that's easier for them to navigate around. So, but it's all coming from the same source. So when you query that, you can either look at it in 3D and it, click on it and it goes back to the database and pulls back the information about that light fitting. Or alternatively, you can, uh, you can look at it in 2D. And finally, what this is then doing is then, again, checking the information that we want to know about a light fitting. It's, it's, it's ridiculous if you end up with 20 or 30 attributes of a, a luminaire you probably only want from a, a maintenance or a replacement perspective four or five. So let's make sure that we've got those. And then when we then update the information from the product library, so it might be it's a generic luminaire, but then you say, right, we actually are using this luminaire. And then you then update it um, progressively. Okay, that's... Uh,
Thank you, George. I'm sure that anybody involved in BIM here has been consultants. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, and been on the receiving end, perhaps uh, involved in uh, design management meetings. Um, <laughs> I would encourage you to seek out Active Plan and um, and use the template to have a look at what the BRE are doing on that side of things because it, it's uh, it's really cutting edge stuff and I think it's probably going to be the industry in the future. Not that I'm a BIM expert, right? I have to say. Um, okay, so whether we're doing BIM or asset information requirements or whether we're doing a, a survey, uh, an asset survey. We need to ask this one question. In my opinion, 